Welcome to our learning module on advanced care planning. Our speaker is Courtney Bruce from the Center for Medical Ethics and Health Policy at Baylor College of Medicine. I could begin by providing you all the statistics that show that physicians and clinicians in general do not ask their patients about treatment preferences, particularly end-of-life preferences. I could show you the statistics that show that physicians do not know their patients' preferences at all, even those patients they've had for years as part of their primary service. I could try to impress upon you that ethical challenges are created at the end of life when families and surrogate decision makers have no idea what their loved ones would want for treatment at the end of life. But you know this. If you're watching this presentation, it's probably because you already know that advanced care planning is important. Advanced care planning allows your patients to think about and make decisions about the care they would want to receive if they become unable to speak. Advanced directives, specifically, are documents that allow a person to put those wishes and treatment decisions into writing. The Patient Self-Determination Act does not require that you, as a physician, actually engage in a conversation about advanced directives, much less have a very good conversation. Fortunately, that environment is changing. In September 2014, the Institute of Medicine, an organization that provides recommendations for public and health policy, they called for systemic changes regarding how and when advanced care planning conversations occur. In July 2015, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services issued a rule establishing separate payment for advanced care planning discussions with Medicare beneficiaries, which would include reimbursing physicians for the time they spend discussing and completing advanced directives with their patients. Professional organizations in the government are making a statement. A statement that says, we now have the ability to prolong lives through medical technology to a point where patients are suffering, one where we're prolonging the dying process rather than extending life in a meaningful way. And we know many people would not want to do that. And we know quality of life considerations are important to many people. Decisions at the end of life are very personal types of decisions, and they're informed by faith and community and ethics, and each person has different opinions about the things they consider important, and the burdens they want to avoid. We want to learn more about people's preferences regarding their treatment for the end of life. Death, dying, advanced directives, do not resuscitate, full code, big, big words, and you're probably worried that you're going to scare your patients by using these words, but you actually won't scare them. The purpose of this presentation is to provide you tips for initiating the conversation with your patients in a non-threatening and very helpful way. Let's get started. I'm first going to show you how not to have the conversation by using a case example. Here we have a 53-year-old woman and she's admitted to the hospital because of lower extremity swelling and pain. She has a history of breast cancer, metastatic to bone and liver. She's been treated with several different courses of combination chemotherapy. There is no record of an existing advanced directive or evidence of any discussion about advanced care planning in the medical record. The diagnostic workup reveals an extensive deep vein thrombosis. Physician comes into her room and he says, Mrs. B, if anything were to happen, do you want us to do everything? Mrs. B responds, I don't understand. And the physician says, well, if your heart were to stop, would you want us to use shocks to start your heart and put you on a breathing machine? Miss B responds, uh, I guess so. The physician says, in turn, you mean you want us to jump up and down and break your ribs and put a big plastic tube down in your throat and a lot of aggressive and invasive measures only to have you die in the intensive care unit? Mrs. B says, oh, oh goodness, I guess not. And the physician says, okay, so it sounds like you want a DNR status. How to start the conversation. What went wrong in my case example? The obvious misstep is that the physician here started at the end. He wanted to get to an outcome, and in doing so, he skipped the process and pushed or inappropriately nudged the patient to a particular course of action. Don't skip the process. First, tell your patients that you always, as a matter of practice, have advanced care planning conversations. Normalize it. Tell them that advanced care planning is not meant to discourage them in any way, that no one expects anything to happen, but it's always good to be prepared well ahead of time. That with all things in life, it's better to hope for the best, even expect the best, but to also prepare for worst case scenario. By saying these things, you help 
to normalize it. Second, briefly explain what advanced care planning is. It's a plan for healthcare. Ask the patient to tell about what they have going on with them health-wise and what they expect for their health in the next few months. This allows you to elicit the patient's understanding of their diagnosis and prognosis and you can correct misimpressions. By asking them what they expect for their health in the next few years, they might talk about hospitalizations and the use of ventilators or other life-supporting measures, which might allow you to explore their preferences a bit. Now the question becomes, how do you explore preferences? Well, it's not easy, but it really doesn't take too much time if done right. I wouldn't ask, what are your preferences, what are your goals, what are your values, or what do you want at the end of life? Those sorts of questions, while very well-intentioned, are usually just too broad and abstract to get you meaningful information. Instead, say something like this. In order to make a good healthcare plan, I need to learn a little bit about the types of activities you really value, and at what point you'd say that life-prolonging measures are just too much. Are you the type of person who really values being able to do simple daily activities like feeding, bathing, and walking without difficulty? Tell me about your perspective if you, for example, were to experience a condition where you might not be able to feed, bathe, or walk without difficulty. Do you think you would want to be put on or continue life-supporting measures like the ventilator in that sort of circumstance? Maybe consider exploring other values. How important is it for your patient to talk and interact meaningfully? How do they feel about becoming dependent on machines like mechanical ventilation or dialysis? For long periods of time. Asking these sorts of questions will allow you to know more about your patient's preferences. Write out what you learned and ask your patient if that story of their preferences is accurate. Your goal is to be able to have a good story that captures the essence of who the patient is and at what point he or she might say that life prolonging measures are too much, if there is such a point. Then be sure to place the story in the medical record. I might even suggest you provide copies to the patient of their story, or to the patient's family recounting their story, and encourage them to bring it in for hospitalizations, particularly long-term hospitalizations. You could also encourage your patients to complete advanced directives. There are three types of advanced directives in Texas. One document is the medical power of attorney. This allows your patient to appoint someone to make treatment decisions if your patients are unable to make decisions or communicate them. Another type of advanced directive is the living will, also known as the directive to physicians. It is specific to ends of life circumstances. Through this, your patient can communicate his or her treatment preferences about the ventilator, the dialysis, etc. for if or when he or she is in a terminal or irreversible condition and cannot make decisions him or herself. A third type of advanced directive is the out of hospital DNR order which limits resuscitations in settings outside of the hospital for if and when the patient's heart might stop. Please try to get your patient's preferences and advanced directives into the chart. Now, we should make clear that the conversations do not have to lead to a decision in one office visit or even a couple of office visits. Just raising the subject is the most important thing you can do for your patients. Death, dying, advanced directives, do not resuscitate, full code, big, big words. And you're probably worried you're gonna scare your patients by using those words, but you won't scare them. If anything, you'll be doing right by them and even trying to hear their voice. We hope you found this helpful. Thank you for your attention. We hope you have enjoyed this session. You have been listening to Courtney Bruce from the Center for Medical Ethics and Health Policy at Baylor College of Medicine.